Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. It is great to see how many have joined us here today and welcome to this webinar hosted today by Intertech. The speaker today is Rich Bycheck, Global Technical Director, Transportation Technologies from Intertech. Rich, is, Rich has over 25 years experience in the product development and validation testing, 17 of which have been spent at Intertech. Rich is experienced in areas of energy storage, audio equipment, and EMC testing. As Intertech's global technical lead for electrical vehicle and energy storage, Rich sits, Rich sits on several um, SAE, IEC, LU, and ANIS standards panel. He holds a bachelor's degree of science in electrical engineering from Lawrence Technology University in Southfield, Michigan, and is based in the Intertech facility located in Plymouth, Michigan. We do encourage you to ask plenty of questions at any point during the webinar. Please type your questions into the Q&A box you will find at the bottom of the screen. At the end of the presentation, we will present your questions, questions and answer as many as possible. It is an absolute pleasure to have Rich with us today, and I would like to warmly welcome him now to take control and begin the session. Thank you, Martin. Yes, hello everyone. This is Rich Bycheck with Intertech. Um, Today's topic is cell and battery abuse, a development of thermal runaway propagation tests for EV and stationary batteries. So mainly we'll be talking about uh, the various methods and uh, some of the pitfalls of cell to cell propagation testing methods. Quick agenda, I'd like to uh, give a brief introduction of uh, myself and, and uh, my company, Intertech. Uh, then we'll talk uh, directly into propagation testing, the concerns, the general concerns based on the industries and uh, different stakeholders, uh, and then look at uh, where that brings us in terms of the test methods, regulations, standards that are out there uh, related specifically to uh, cell propagation um, requirements. Then we look into you know what does it actually take to implement a cell or module uh, battery propagation test and then a few of the challenges and pitfalls and, and call it lessons learned uh, from myself uh, on the testing side you know as a testing laboratory you know our viewpoint on things so um, not a manufacturer i'm not here to tell you how to design the batteries but uh, really to give you an indication of you know what are the pitfalls in terms of the actual testing environments and meeting those requirements so Intertech, um, we are a global uh, ATIC organization, meaning assurance, testing, inspection, and certifications. Um, in the energy storage realm, battery testing, uh, heavily focused around our automotive testing laboratories, the ones you see on the screen here, North America, Europe, and greater China, uh, where we focus on performance, safety, and abuse testing of batteries from hearing aid size up through uh, megawatt energy storage. Some of the key tests and methods, of course, UN 38.3, for those of you that uh, may not be familiar with that, it's a transportation regulation testing uh, for shipping, uh, specifically lithium or lithium ion batteries. And then throughout the different certification schemes, we are a, a notified body in the European Union. We are a national certification body within the IEC EECB scheme and an NRTL, nationally recognized te testing laboratory in North America, US and Canada, uh, where we issue our ETL safety mark. <clears throat> and this is typically to ANSI UL, CSA or IEC EN standards uh, for certifications. And then in the automotive sector, uh, more customized OEM based uh, test requirements, as well as the SAE abuse and performance tests. I mentioned the three regions on the previous map. Uh, so we do test for everything from again hearing aid, small coin cell, button cell up through megawatt uh, EV and energy storage side systems. Uh, our centers of excellence are here in Plymouth, Michigan, in Germany and Sweden in the EU, and in Shanghai, China. Uh, we have additional uh, smaller test labs uh, throughout those regions that focus on mainly consumer type batteries. Uh, and this uh, uh, primarily gets into the safety certification testing like the UN, the AUL, IEC and CE tests. Uh, however, we also get into more custom abusive tests uh, like fire, uh, fire and cell propagation. Now aside from performing the abuse and failure types of tests, uh, we do offer uh, consulting services, advisory services, more specifically failure analysis um, 
disassembly, dissection of uh, failed cells, reference cells, uh, looking at uh, manufacturing uh, quality as well as actual field returns and failures. Uh, so this can uh, start from the, call it paperwork side, um, reviewing your own risk assessment process, your FMEAs, your manufacturing controls, technical assessments of your manufacturing facilities, and then actual physical testing disassembly of cells or batteries. <clears throat> so with that, I'll also put my um, contact information on the screen at the end of the session during the Q&A, so you can feel free to reach out to me directly uh, if you have uh, additional questions or potentially testing needs. Uh, now we'll get into the actual uh, meat of today's discussion, propagation testing, and where do those propagation concerns come from? What are we talking about when we say propagation? So first, what is propagation? Um, uh, simple terminology, we, we look at what we call thermal runaway, which is where um, even when an external uh, stress source is removed that a battery, specifically lithium ion uh, batteries in this case, will uh, continue to evolve their own heat and potentially uh, rupture, disassemble, explode, or catch fire. Um, so if that thermal runaway is contained within a single cell, uh, that's not considered propagation. But once, <clears throat> once that uh, thermal runaway actually cascades or propagates uh, to the adjacent cells and spreads throughout the uh, a battery, uh, that's what we talk about uh, propagation, meaning that uh, even though a single cell would have some reason to go into a thermal runaway. Uh, it should be self-limiting, but based on the design of a battery or the layout of a battery or the capacity of a battery, uh, the, uh, the physical structure allows that uh, event to spread uh, across a, additional cells that would otherwise be considered healthy. Um, <clears throat> and I do want to notice, uh, note again here that the focus today is on lithium ion cells specifically. Um, you know, that's where I would say most of the uh, effort and uh, concerns are placed uh, versus other uh, cell types, other chemistries, other, other battery types that have their own, if you will, unique failure modes. Now, some of the causes of the individual cell level failures, not necessarily the propagation event, but the actual trigger event at a single cell. Uh, we, of course, have manufacturing defects and aging defects or aging effects, I should say. Um, you know, these are more inherent to the cell itself uh, that it, if you will, brings to the table. Uh, but then you have more of your abusive conditions, whether they be electrical abuse, mechanical abuse, or thermal abuse, basically being exerted externally on the cell. When we look at manufacturing or aging defects, we're thinking of things like internal short circuits, where um, a defect or a, a foreign object inside the cell that was somehow uh, allowed into the cell, maybe, maybe during the manufacturing process, or a, a short circuit that occurs due to normal expansion and contraction over time of, of charging and discharging or, or thermal cycling that allows a, a wear point to occur within the cell, providing a short circuit from anode to cathode, um, if you will, behind the, the terminals of the, the battery pack. And uh, aging effects could also just be, if you will, the consumption of all the active materials on one side of the anode or cathode that would lead to potential side reactions. Now we look at those abusive conditions I mentioned. Uh, the chart on the right comes from uh, some core IEC standards where we look at the, the normal operating range of, of batteries and you have temperatures, you have voltage and you have current. Um, you know, those three kind of magic uh, you know, triangle of, uh, of parameters. If the cell is maintained within those three operating regions, cell, uh, charging current, discharging current, charging or discharge voltage, and operating temperature, uh, there should be no side reactions, there should be no thermal runaway, there should be no uh, hazardous events occurring from the cell. So uh, when we talk about abusive conditions, it's when we intentionally or unintentionally drive the cell beyond those parameters. On the mechanical side, this is where we basically have crushing, penetration, other exposure of corrosion materials or, or water that could uh, basically affect the cell um, or, or 
otherwise uh, distort the physical construction of the cell, potentially uh, creating uh, that internal short circuit like we talked about uh, that would normally be from a manufacturing defect. Um, things like water exposure corrosion could lead to an external short circuit of, of sorts. Um, electrical abuse, that would be your normal external short circuit, which could be an overload on the load that the battery's uh, sourcing. Uh, it could be a, a shorted uh, fan or motor. It could be an actual hard short, if you will, where the terminals are just crossed due to some external uh, conductive means. Uh, overcharge, uh, we think about overcharge in terms of current and voltage typically, but also of capacity. If you're just allowing the battery to continue charging even beyond its 100% uh, state of charge. And finally, thermal abuse. Generally, you're talking about excessive over temperature or potentially even exposure to fire or other uh, basically heating means. Now, how can we prevent these cell level failures from occurring? Of course, we have the, the first two in terms of uh, the manufacturing defects or aging uh, effects. Generally speaking, those can be mitigated quite a bit from manufacturing controls uh, and if you will, statistical uh, process control where you minimize the likelihood that a cell comes off of the factory line with a predisposition to having a thermal runaway before its uh, other cells. And you would assume that if the cell is, is well balanced in terms of active materials, anode and cathode, uh, very clean or pure um, electrolyte mix, that any aging effects would generally have um, the net effect that the battery's capacity at the end of its life would be low enough that it would preclude the ability to create a thermal event or a thermal runaway. Um, however, um, statistically speaking, cells will end up going into thermal runaway at some point. And that doesn't mean all cells, it means that one cell out of a million, for example, at a one PPM rate or less, uh, can still go into thermal runaway somewhere in the field, regardless of those external abuse conditions. And then for controlling those external abuse conditions, uh, physical design of the battery layout enclosure or other physical protections, mechanical uh, protections in place, as well as battery management system design, which helps limit uh, the batteries operating um, when it exceeds those temperature limits, when it exceeds uh, voltage or current operating limits that the battery essentially shuts down uh, and doesn't allow itself to go beyond those parameters. Now, we take the first point that even with battery management systems, even with physical protection shielding in place, statistically speaking, a single cell uh, can and will go into runaway from time to time based on some level of defect or aging effect. <clears throat> or if those uh, physical abusive conditions take place um, beyond the control uh, of the battery management system. Um, <clears throat> If that occurs and the cell is somewhat self-limiting, meaning that individual cell goes into runaway, it self-extinguishes over time, it doesn't cause any additional physical damage or fire spread within the battery, although the battery pack or, or full system may be rendered non-operable at the end of that event, it doesn't create an additional safety hazard at that point. However, if additional cells, adjacent cells, are somehow heated or adversely uh, react because of the first runaway cell, now we have a propagation event. If the enclosure or the overall system uh, design does not contain any uh, specific visible flame or fire such that it could spread to uh, adjacent combustible materials, that would be considered a propagation event or failure. And if the propagation event is really not self-extinguishing, meaning it continues to cascade uh, such that uh, it never uh, self-extinguishes or uh, whatever extinguishing means are in place already either in that battery or adjacent to that battery in the room that the battery is installed is not sufficient to uh, contain any level of fire or or um, thermal event, then you have what we call a propagation failure. And I, I say these as general notes, it still depends on who you ask in terms of what's considered a failure, what's considered a passing result, or what's considered an acceptable level of propagation that could occur. <clears throat> 
So who are those stakeholders that I would ask and who are those uh, depending uh, on people? First, we have the transportation concerns. So this would be your dangerous goods regulators, those who actually determine um, the hazards associated with dangerous goods in the transport stream uh, by air, by ground, by rail, by sea. Um, and lithium ion batteries specifically are regulated as class nine dangerous goods because they can have um, the thermal runaway effect. They can cause a hazard in transportation under some conditions, primarily some external uh, stress sources or abuse sources. <clears throat> Specific concerns here in transportation are that the batteries could be in an aircraft, in the cargo hold, or in the passenger compartment, and you have a finite volume within the airplane, and you don't have the ability for passengers, pilots to quickly evacuate that and get themselves away from, from the event. So primary concern here is generally batteries that are being carried in aircraft that if there is a propagation event that you have more than basically a handful of cells going into thermal runaway, even if you contain the physical flames that occur, uh, there's an expectation that you're going to produce um, a, a lot of smoke and you could actually reduce the ability for um, the passengers or the, the pilots to uh, first of all, breathe, but secondly, uh, be able to see outside. Obviously, at, at high altitudes, it's not possible to easily vent um, or depressurize the, the cabin, um, especially once you're in an emergency situation. So that's the highest uh, concern there. But we also have the concerns of batteries that are later on in their life. They've been damaged uh, during usage, but still would be subject to be transported to a disposal or recycling facility. And then you have the end of life batteries or those aging effect concerns, batteries at the end of life being transported uh, again for recycling or disposal. So the transportation regulators have these multiple concerns that if a battery could go into thermal runaway and have a propagation event, uh, that it would be sufficient to overcome uh, the transportation means, the aircraft, uh, the vessel, the vehicle. Uh, and cause further damage. UN 38.3, which is a, the common test regime for batteries going through um, transportation, uh, does not directly assess propagation events. It really focuses primarily on the ability of the battery management system and the enclosure to protect uh, the internal cells and batteries from uh, those abusive conditions. Now we look beyond transportation, we look at the actual applications. First, we look at consumer products. I, I have the example here of a cell phone, laptops, medical devices, anything that's basically in the consumer space, um, carried by people, portable devices, maybe even some somewhat stationary, uh, things like UPS batteries that might be in your home. Um, there's of course concerns of variability in product quality. You have multiple manufacturers, you have online internet uh, retailers uh, or direct direct source vendors, you have multiple uh, contract manufacturers, multiple cell manufacturers and vendors throughout the, 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 the space. Uh, so there is quite a bit of variability and, and that means there can be some lower quality products that may uh, somewhat pass, if you will, their upfront qualification tests and, and reviews or audits, but through the entirety of production, not only that, uh, that low PPM rate of uh, inevitable failures, but a higher uh, failure rate or a higher uh, issue rate due to uh, quality um, uh, variability. Uh, we have non-harmonized regulations, and, and by this I mean that uh, product safety standards, certification requirements, uh, demonstration by the manufacturer of the safety of their product uh, is not uh, consistent across all borders and across all industries. Uh, certain industries, especially battery powered devices that don't plug into the wall, uh, are often less heavily regulated than, than devices that might have a battery inside that do connect uh, to grid uh, power plugging into the wall where uh, there tends to be a higher uh, level of consideration for safety certification or demonstration declaration of the product's safety. Um, we also have the concern of non-OEM chargers and replacement uh, cells or batteries. So power tools where you, you have the original OEM uh, designed and built and relatively safe battery is at its end of life and you purchase uh, or replace that with uh, an unknown origin uh, battery or more commonly the unknown origin charger, um, especially as most devices, uh, consumer devices have a USB charging interface. 
if the battery itself doesn't have the right protections in place, that external charger that may or may not meet the, the USB protocol or have all the right limitations put in place uh, could essentially uh, create those abusive electrical conditions on the battery. Uh, and then of course, your normal handling and abuse uh, conditions. You have handheld devices, they're dropped, they're rained on, they're washed, they're otherwise uh, handled just like any other product and not necessarily considered as a, as a dangerous good by a consumer. So that, that battery that's held in hand may have been through some physical abuse as well as electrical or thermal abuse over time and may be essentially uh, uh, ready to uh, go into thermal runaway at any point. And finally, the statistical numbers, even under top quality conditions, even under the best manufacturing controls with millions and millions of cells out in the field, you're eventually gonna have some that can go into a thermal runaway and therefore brings a risk of potential propagation. Next electric vehicles, again, I come from the automotive industry, um, always a concern of propagation occurring, primarily that it can occur rapidly. Uh, similar to the aircraft situation I spoke about before, we look at vehicles, whether they're on-road vehicles, off-road vehicles, industrial trucks, uh, the, the, does the passenger have enough time to get away from the vehicle before a propagation uh, event would occur or create a, you know, a large amount of flame um, or smoke? <clears throat> Crashes, accidents, vehicle accidents like the the, the example just on the screen here, you have the additional fuel, meaning the fuel from the fuel tanks of either a hybrid vehicle with the electric vehicle battery in it, or the vehicle that an electric vehicle is uh, coming into contact with, which also could spill fuel oils. So you have uh, the case that you have a direct fire exposure as well as then the battery going into propagation because it's been exposed to that external fire. Um, again, I, I bring up the statistical means. Electric vehicles have hundreds of individual cells per vehicle. So even at a, a one PPM failure rate um, and roughly a hundred individual cells per electric vehicle battery, uh, that means generally speaking, at least one out of every 10,000 vehicles will exhibit a single cell uh, thermal runaway event or failure, uh, which could be <clears throat> a propagation uh, hazard if the overall battery pack design doesn't take into effect uh, ways to mitigate that cell to cell propagation. Finally, I've talked about energy storage concerns, and this is really where a lot of the cell to cell propagation test requirements regulations are, are being driven from, uh, aside from the transportation to consumer and the electric vehicle. Um, realms, we have a special case, if you will, in terms of stationary energy storage, in that these are often installed in very large arrays uh, within buildings. Um, often these are retrofits, the example of like server rooms where um, in previous iterations, they had lead acid or NICAD batteries or other energy storage means that are being upgraded or retrofitted with lithium ion systems. And the building codes just are not up to uh, handling the events or the case of a lithium ion battery fire. Uh, so you have to consider things like fire suppression in the building, the ventilation means in the building that may have been designed for either no specific battery requirements or for lead acid or NICAD batteries where the main concern was just ventilation of potential hydrogen gas buildups, but not generally a concern for um, fire <clears throat> emanating from the batteries themselves. So um, when you have lithium ion batteries where that's a greater concern, um, this is of course a concern for electrical and fire inspectors, um, installers, insurance agencies, landlords um, for these buildings, especially when you consider that server rooms may be in the basement, maybe uh, you know, are not exterior to the building. They are built in, if you will, centrally located within a building and therefore any type of propagation event that occurs within that room could spread throughout the building and becomes a hazard to any other um, inhabitants of the building at that time. Um, and I also note here, <clears throat> because these are evolving at different rates in terms of different markets having higher uh, adoption of new battery technologies, those electrical and fire inspectors uh, may not be as, as up to speed on what they should be looking for. And they treat based on old building codes for lead acid batteries and assume that they've got a safe situation. Um, additionally, these are um, often built in situ custom uh, designs for a specific application. So there really is no full scale pre-screening of that battery design. There's an assumption that um, 
the, the small building block system when uh, built up into a very large modular array uh, will have the same overall performance. So not to scare everybody with those concerns, but obviously those are major concerns across multiple industries, uh, which have driven um, the development of multiple test methods and test standards. So again, looking at the different stakeholders, again, we have our transportation regulators or dangerous goods people. Um, as I noted before, UN 38.3 does not address cell to cell propagation. So there is work underway um, from the UNEC based um, committees of, of dangerous goods experts to create a new battery classification or a new dangerous goods classification for lithium and lithium ion batteries. Currently, they fall under, if you will, a catch all uh, class nine grouping, which is a, you know, uh, it doesn't fall under the other categories. It doesn't, it's not considered corrosive. It's not specifically explosive or flammable, but it can cause a hazard under some transportation conditions. And the majority of the documented uh, exemptions, packaging requirements, limitations within the class nine uh, realm are dedicated to lithium batteries. And that's why uh, the image you see on the screen here has actually been uh, adopted as a uh, subset of class nine goods to really identify that these are batteries as opposed to some other product. Uh, so the, the effort here is to further classify batteries as their own, if you will, class 10 product. Uh, and within that, we would include propagation risk uh, mitigation, whether or not a battery is more inherently able to create a propagation event or not. A um, lot of active work here. I, I note the SAE International uh, G27 committee uh, publishing the AS6413 standard focusing on packaging and that, that it actually has just gone out as a, a draft for vote uh, just this week. Um, and then I mentioned the uh, the work overall for the, the class 10, if you will, uh, battery standard for transportation. So this addresses both packaging as well as uh, battery designs. On the consumer products, uh, I mentioned there's a, a lack of harmonization, but there are some very common standards that do uh, tend to cross multiple industries. Um, and in general, these standards really focus on mitigating those abusive conditions through uh, battery management system and physical um, uh, enclosure designs. Um, however, they don't generally address the concerns of what happens if a propagation event still occurs despite all those other controls. Again, the manufacturing defects or the aging effects. So we do have some standards out there. Our tests, uh, the internal short circuit or forced internal short circuit adopted within uh, IEC standards. Uh, we have uh, nail penetration tests, which are not as commonly adopted within standards, but uh, from an industry base, there, there's a lot of use of nail penetration or similar uh, mechanical indentation or puncturing tests to see what happens, what would be the worst case uh, if a battery could go into uh, some sort of a thermal runaway. Um, but generally speaking, those are not falling within certification or, stand, or safety standards, and therefore there's really not a mandatory control for those things to be considered uh, in the design of a battery, even if you have a certified, uh, a safety certified battery. Um, <clears throat> So the concern here on uh, most of the consumer product standards is there really is no consideration for cell to cell propagation. <clears throat> now we look into electric vehicle and they call e-mobility, meaning uh, really the, the off-road or non-passenger vehicle applications like the industrial truck here, electric bicycles, the hoverboards of the last few years or, or scooters, uh, rideshare uh, devices like that, as well as other e-mobility devices like wheelchairs, et cetera, that could use fairly large um, battery packs to, to provide uh, sufficient motive power as well as range. Uh, so in this area, we have a few common regulations across most of the, uh, the globe. We have the UNECE R100 or e-marking battery regulation. Similar to the consumer standards, there's much more focus on the typical abuses and a little bit on external fire, which would be a potential propagation source. So again, focus there is on enclosure shielding of the battery as well as battery management system. And there are no cell level requirements. Uh, in the US and Canada, we have our our automotive uh, FMVSS, CMVSS uh, test requirements, uh, those do not really address specific propagation means. There's really just considerations for the um, 
overall effect of a battery that's been in a crash event, uh, not uh, providing, if you will, secondary um, hazards or secondary um, exposure to passengers in the vehicle. <clears throat> So finally, I get to the more industry-based uh, standards where you talk about workplace safety, uh, like the OSHA here in the US. Um, and there we have the ANSI UL 2580 standard, which is technically defined as an electric vehicle standard, but in practice is really addressing uh, large format batteries used for electric versions of things like forklifts and other industrial trucks or, or pallet jacks handlers. Um, within that standard, we do have what we call a single cell failure design tolerance test. Um, Long word basically meaning cell to cell propagation. Uh, and the, the justification being that since there is a possibility that a fail, cell may fail within a battery system, the battery system shall be designed to prevent that single cell failure from propagating to the extent that there is a fire external to the DUT or an explosion. So as I mentioned before, that's the, the key pass fail criteria here is, do I prevent external flame and do I prevent an explosion or propelling of shrapnel from a battery that's gone through some level of thermal runaway. Now we look again, energy storage uh, standards, stationary systems. Here we have a, a much stronger regulatory push. Um, and primarily in the US, we have NFPA 855, which is a, a building code um, addressing specifically energy storage installations within a building or exterior to a building. And within this uh, building code, we reference uh, UL 9540, which is an energy storage system safety standard. Uh, this is also adopted in Canada, so this is a binational standard. Within that, we have UL 1973, which is a battery safety certification standard. And that UL 1973 standard has essentially the same test as I spoke about on the previous slide, the single cell design tolerance test or a cell to cell propagation with basic you know, fire or no fire, explosion or no explosion uh, criteria if you trigger a single cell into runaway. But uh, the, the more stringent or, or probably the highest uh, uh, concern is uh, what happens in a worst case condition. Maybe there's multiple cells. What can potentially happen um, inside a building with a large format installation, um, you know, we want to consider what that worst case condition may be. Um, from a test lab standpoint, from a manufacturer standpoint, we of course like to demonstrate uh, safety of a system, but from a regulator standpoint, from an insurance standpoint, from a landlord standpoint, or the, the inhabitants of a building, they want to know that they're going to be protected from the worst case situation. And that's where we talk about UL 9540A, or the test method for evaluating thermal runaway fire propagation in battery energy storage systems. Basically uh, speaking, it's a, a larger um, or a longer format of a cell to cell propagation test method. I show a, a screen capture here on the left hand side, which is the general test flow of UL 9540A. Uh, and simply, we have a cell level test primarily meant to determine a repeatable method for triggering a cell or a specific cell type to go into thermal runaway uh, so that we can utilize that method for uh, attempting to create a propagation event. And then, once we have developed or determined a repeatable method to trigger a single cell into thermal runaway, we place that cell within a module um, and, and basically attempt to trigger that cell to cell propagation. Then from the module level, meaning some sort of building block within the battery system, we get to the unit level test, which would be the whatever version of, of a battery or however many modules, however many cells are in a single full enclosure with its own battery management system, if you will, as a standalone uh, building block, uh, testing at that level. So it could be a larger level, could be considering multiple uh, cells going in the runaway at the same time. Again, more of a worst case situation that could occur when you string multiple modules and cells together. And then finally, we have what we call the installation level test. <clears throat> this considers not only the battery units, but also how many units can be placed, if you will, side by side or in the same enclosed space. And then what is the contribution of that enclosed space? Is there sufficient fire suppression? Is there sufficient additional shielding or uh, mechanical or spacing means within that uh, area that would preclude the ability from a, a cell to cell propagation event from one battery to skip across, if you will, to the adjacent batteries or overcome the fire suppression or the protection systems built into the facility? 
Now, while I'm not going into too many of the specific details of the individual test methods, I am focusing primarily on overall methods of triggering single cell thermal runaway events and the pros and cons of those methods when utilized to uh, try to trigger a cell to cell propagation event within a battery or within a module. <clears throat> so the first method we look at, and, and I would say the, the preferred method, um, specifically in UL 9540A, this is listed as the primary method to be used before others are, are uh, alternately considered, and that's heating basically external heating of an individual cell. I show a couple of examples here of the different types of captain heaters or, or cartridge heaters that can be used. Um, you may use something like the, the, the large surface area captain heater to more or less wrap a cell such that you can heat that cell externally without hopefully uh, adding heat to adjacent cells or the <clears throat> cartridge or, or the, the plug heaters that you see on the top, which could essentially replace an individual cell within a battery. So rather than simulating the actual uh, cell itself going in the runaway, it's a means of providing an external heater to the adjacent cells uh, to also uh, attempt to trigger a, a runaway event uh, at one of those cells. Um, the main reasons for this being a preferred method, uh, heaters are generally low cost. They're essentially consumables. Uh, again, if you go to omega.com, you'll find these are, are just for a few dollars and come in multiple uh, variations of sizes and shapes and ability to wrap and fold uh, around different cell types and sizes. So uh, you consider not only cylindrical, not only prismatic, but a lot of different uh, cell configurations and constructions. Um, however, uh, the cons, the 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 backside of that is uh, heaters will take up space and depending on how a battery pack is packaged or the spacing or the insulation uh, potting used between cells uh, can be essentially modified or damaged to allow for the placement of uh, the external heater. And that may artificially uh, skew uh, any test result or performance because you're essentially removing um, some of the protection that's built into the design of the battery. So anytime you introduce a foreign substance here or a modification to an already manufactured battery, you, you introduce additional variables that may or may not affect uh, the results of a test. Next penetration uh, methods, and I show the example here, uh, not so much that uh, I would expect in a test lab that we would try to drill straight through a cell to see what happens, but rather, um, this would be the preparation of a sample that you'd create a hole in the enclosure such that you could then drive uh, a nail or some other indentation fixture uh, into an individual cell to try and trigger an internal short circuit uh, within uh, that individual cell and, and cause it to cascade throughout the battery pack. Uh, <clears throat> as you can see here, you have to modify uh, the enclosure somehow because you need to have uh, access, physical access to the cell that's inside. And then you're introducing again, a foreign object, this uh, nail or, or indentation tool to go into the cells. <clears throat> so the pros are that, um, you can use different variations of indentation tools, penetration, conductive or non-conductive based on a known failure mode of a given cell. So if you have a repeatable uh, mechanical means of triggering a cell in the runaway, uh, that may be your only option here versus heating or some of the other methods. Um, however, um, you generally are limited to having either a cell that's on the outer, outermost uh, layer of a battery pack. So a battery like the one shown in the picture here, which may and may have multiple cells uh, scattered throughout in a more of an XY or XYZ uh, configuration, um, you generally want to try and get a more centrally located cell so that there's multiple means of propagating to adjacent cells. Uh, so you limit yourself by typically having to go to an externally located cell or clearing space and removing cells so you can get to that more centrally located cell, which again could have either a positive or a negative effect of either removing some uh, heat sinking capacity of those adjacent cells or introducing a new path for propagation because you're removing or adjusting uh, either the enclosure or the cells. And of course, by pu puncturing a hole in the outer uh, core of a, an enclosure, you may create a path for visible flame to escape, uh, which uh, again, if that hole was sealed up, would that allow for a buildup of pressure or would it actually have uh, 
prevented uh, fire from being visible outside the enclosure. So um, penetration or other mechanical crushing means are actually very difficult to implement, especially on the larger uh, energy storage systems. External fire. Um, I talk about the projectile test here and the, the photo that's shown here is an actual uh, projectile test according to the UL 1642 standard. Uh, basically, you have a single cell without any additional uh, mechanical protections around it directly um, impinged with a flame, with an open flame, a Bunsen burner, if you will. Um, this is a bit of a worst case scenario. You're trying to get a direct uh, overheating with flame or you know flame source um, acting on a cell such that even if the cell vents uh, due to overheating, that vented gas or vented uh, fluid uh, will probably catch fire as well. So at the single cell level, if you have a, ba if you have a cell that has a fairly benign reaction, uh, you generally have a, uh, a higher confidence that uh, you will not have cell to cell propagation. And some of the test methods allow you to use this as a, uh, if you will, pre-qualification that a, a cell doesn't have enough energy to create a propagation event. Uh, however, that's not uh, harmonized across the board. And some of the uh, the cons when you try to scale this up to being a large format system, when you consider things like the enclosure, the shielding of the enclosure, the the uh, density of cells that are are placed within that battery pack, um, it can become quite costly, and the 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 risk to the laboratory is actually much greater because you're dealing with a much larger size system, and you're also dealing with uh, direct. Uh, application of flame. So the working with fire is, of course, dangerous on its own, dealing with large amounts of energy stored in the battery uh, and a potential explosion or fire source, um, you know, leads to multiple uh, risks for the laboratory, um, as well as, of course, excessive cost for those who build the battery samples uh, for test the manufacturers themselves. Um, and when we talk about cell to cell propagation, a large format external fire test really makes it difficult to isolate an individual cell to try to trigger that single cell event. It's, it's really, external fire is really a separate test method altogether when you think about it. FIC, forced internal short circuit, again, similar to the mechanical um, abuse means this is a way to impart um, a simulation of a manufacturing defect on a cell. Um, there is some acceptance uh, across multiple uh, regions, uh, especially within some of the IEC test standards. Um, it doesn't create any secondary stress to the adjacent cells. Basically, the cell that's being modified is the only one that has this uh, uh, defect uh, imparted on it. However, on, on the flip side, uh, it's very difficult to make these kind of adjustments to a cell in the field because you have to physically unwrap that cell and you're taking it out of its normal, call it manufacturing, you know, as, as produced uh, format to add this foreign agent. And then it's really not possible to put the battery back together as it originally was, or to put the cell back together as it originally was. So while this is a, a nice for evaluating the individual cells, similar to the projectile test on the previous slide, it's actually a pretty difficult method to use for modifying a single cell, putting it back into the battery, and then somehow trying to find a secondary way to trigger this, uh, this shorting device to create uh, that internal short circuit condition. Trigger cells, I, I note this one, I actually show an example here, um, marketed by Cooler Technology, um, which is a, a nice novel idea. I know this has been adopted, especially by uh, some aerospace uh, industries in that you have something similar to the forced internal short circuit cell, but it's produced on the manufacturing line such that you have a cell that is otherwise uh, the same as a non-trigger cell. Um, so, the shorting device, internal shorting device is implemented at the manufacturing stage. And then uh, some simple heating, for example, of a wax separator or, or a simple charge or discharge or overcharge event can trigger that um, uh, shorting device to uh, basically uh, create a short circuit inside the cell so that there's a repeatable means of triggering this cell. Um, there are no modifications to the cells that comes off the factory line. So this could be 
uh, implemented either at the actual manufacturing facility that makes the cells or through someone like a cooler technology that um, has multiple variations of cells which are meant to simulate or emulate uh, some of the more common cell types in the field. Uh, the cons are there's a limited suite of these off the shelf models that are already built up. Uh, OEMs may or may not be willing to create these uh, um, trigger cells because they are inherently uh, unsafe compared to a, a normally produced cell. Uh, and then because you've got a modified cell that's not the same as one that's already cleared the UN 38.3 testing, uh, your transportation may be further restricted. So you have some uh, difficulties in logistics of shipping these out. And once you've installed them in a battery, you essentially have a battery that's been compromised. And under even some normal transportation conditions, you may set that trigger cell into thermal runaway. <clears throat> Now we get into one of the other methods, um, you know, through all the methods I've talked about, primarily that heating method at the beginning is the preferred. Uh, the next, I would say, option from us as a lab standpoint is a single cell overcharge. Um, and this is where we basically tr cause an individual cell to go beyond its voltage current or capacity uh, limits. So that can be a slow charge where you're allowing it to just uh, build up greater than 100% uh, state of charge so that you, you should create uh, some side reactions and expansion, gas evolution, high pressure, high temperature that should create a thermal runaway event, uh, or you're doing that excessive current or voltage where you're driving it beyond its normal operating limits and again triggering some level of um, side reactions within the cell that would uh, initiate a thermal runaway. Um, pros, again, from a lab standpoint, it's fairly easy to implement this because as long as I can access the tabs or uh, the terminals of an individual cell within the battery pack, I can easily run test leads to that to create the overcharge condition without otherwise physically modifying the battery. Um, generally, if I've at the cell level have gone through different iterations of different voltage current or capacity curves, I should be able to uh, zone in on a repeatable method and therefore I have a, a way that can be repeated once the cells uh, placed inside a battery pack. Uh, the cons by having certain overcharge events, I might actually bring that battery that's otherwise very robust and, and, and fairly um, safe compared to other chemistries by driving it to a very high level of state of charge that's well beyond the limits of what it should actually see in the field or be able to see in the field, I, I create a, a greater hazard than the cell would actually prevent even its own worst case uh, use conditions. So there's a there's concern there that I might create a, basically a much more volatile uh, reaction than a cell could actually uh, contribute in the field. Um, <clears throat> also, um, by doing overcharge, which is a normal condition that cells are usually designed to uh, prevent against, uh, it may have some other venting or other protection built into the cell that's going to cause it to vent somewhat uh, in a benign way or otherwise uh, block charging current from the cell so that an overcharge event would not be feasible uh, to trigger a runaway. Likewise, short circuit. Um, external short circuiting of the cell has the same pros as the overcharge test. It's easy to implement at the lab. Uh, you can always define a specific uh, uh, resistance or load curve on the battery to get it to heat up or go into a runaway event versus melting the terminals or having a, a benign reaction where you've essentially discharged all the capacity of the battery or the cell. Uh, you know, there should be a sweet spot in there that I can trigger a fairly repeatable uh, thermal runaway at the cell level. Um, however, just like the overcharge tests, um, depending on the design of the cell, it may not allow a short circuit to actually trigger a thermal runaway. There may be some PTC or other uh, protection device built into the cell that um, will block the flow of current or open the flow of current so that a short circuit is no longer um, shorting the battery, no longer creating a load and it becomes an open circuit. So sometimes uh, it may be uh, difficult to just trigger that event. So now we've talked about, again, the, the primary concerns here is how do you actually create uh, one of these events? And now we get into module level propagation. How do I take that trigger cell and, and verify whether or not it causes uh, a propagation or a triggered event? Um, in general, from a lab standpoint, many of the standards allow for us to test at a representative subsystem level. And I put that in quote marks here because you have to make an engineering judgment on what is considered representative enough of a battery. Uh, the image on the screen here, of course, is from a, a simulation model just showing four cells that are in a, a linear um, 
uh, layout and if you had the event occurring from a, one of the middle two cells there as your trigger cell, uh, it may be sufficient. But if this is just a subsystem of a much larger X, Y, Z um, matrix of cells such that there would be cells above, below, and on either side of the, that trigger cell, this may not be considered as representative of that subsystem. Um, you know, it may also be more difficult to access that trigger cell based on the geometry. Uh, so we want to have considerations of how does a single cell go into failure. Uh, if it has a vent that opens on the top side, we want to make sure that we're verifying that um, that flow uh, is not artificially uh, vented. It's creating the actual uh, in situ situation. So something like the, the image on the screen here, if there's a cell that would be above that, that trigger cell, it needs to be in place during the test. Um, <clears throat> The pros of doing these uh, subsystem level is it's much easier to observe uh, the event. I can put thermal couples on here. I can put a thermal imaging camera on here. I could put an optical camera on here and actually see uh, the events from cell to cell because maybe the enclosure is not in place. I can physically see the individual cells under test. Uh, obviously, for me as a lab, there's a reduced hazard because I don't have a full system, so there's less total energy available. Um, so. On the flip side, uh, the con there is that this is not fully representative of an actual installation. So even if we make the engineering judgment that it's representative, it may not actually take into effect, uh, account all of the physical uh, layout of a full battery system. Um, and I may need some additional pre-stressed heating or something of the adjacent cells to actually get um, the batter to be more predisposed to a runaway condition uh, because by removing the enclosure, removing some of the other cells, I may be either uh, increasing or decreasing the overall cooling of the overall battery. And, and again, it may not be a real world simulation. Unit system installation test. Uh, this is again, primarily within the 9540A standard that even if we do that module level test and we determine there you have limited propagation, uh, there are many cases where we would still perform the test at a full unit, uh, meaning a fully assembled battery within its enclosure or for larger systems, multiple units uh, installed in their normal spacings and in their normal uh, physical environment, potentially with fire suppression. Um, of course, the pros here from a regulatory standpoint, from an inspector standpoint, is that you've actually tested with an actual apples to apples, real world uh, simulation, meaning exactly as it's installed in the field and it's passed the test rather than assuming that a representative subsystem can be correlated to a full installation. So that's that's obviously the, the greatest pro here is that you have a, a greater level of confidence that uh, the battery as installed will not have a propagation event. Um, <clears throat> and if you're relying on overall layout, you're relying on physical spacing, or you're relying on a secondary fire suppression system, then it, it aids in demonstrating the effectiveness of that system in um, putting out any fire that could occur. Uh, the cons there, number one cost, you have to, uh, of course, put the entire system in place. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, these may be one-off systems that are installed, um, you know, custom to a situation. You'd have to build a second one just to do this test that's going to be compromised, it's going to be damaged intentionally, and mostly cannot be used for the actual field installation. And even if it is, it may still not be fully representative of the overall uh, construction of the facility because uh, even though we're simulating things like walls and, and ventilation or fire suppression, it may not be exactly one to one to what the facility is actually going to be modified to when you install the battery. So uh, the unit system installation test, um, while it, it can at the end give you the greatest level of confidence, um, it, it it is often the most difficult to implement. And again, from a, from a lab standpoint, we have to be able to handle what can happen if this goes into a full scale propagation throughout the battery. So a few kilowatt hours of, of battery uh, can be a fairly large uh, event. And when you talk about megawatt installations, um, you know, it's very difficult to contain. And obviously that's why we're running the test, but it's very difficult to even contain in a laboratory environment. So I'll have a few minutes left uh, for, for question and answer here, but uh, just want to give you a few few points here. Um, overall criteria, I mentioned this earlier on, um, 
we don't want to have propagation from the trigger cell to adjacent cells, meaning a single cell can go into thermal runaway, but it shouldn't cause additional cells to go into that same runaway. We don't want to see fire spread beyond the enclosure of the modular battery. So of course, it's expected that there may be some fire from the initial triggered cell because we're simulating that or we're artificially triggering that, but that fire should not spread beyond um, the enclosure of the modular battery. So one point here, we talk about centrally located cells. Uh, if you had a cell that was on the outside edge of a battery pack that went into runaway, would that allow flame to exceed uh, the enclosure versus a cell that's centrally located and physically farther from uh, the wall? So um, there's still a bit of um, iteration that has to be considered here in terms of which locations of cells to trigger for the initial event. <clears throat> Uh, we also look at limited heating of adjacent surfaces, especially for interior installations. Um, if the battery gets hot, if it contains the, the fire within uh, the cabinet, but there is some propagation such that it gets extremely hot, does it actually radiate enough heat that it heats adjacent surfaces, potentially adjacent combustible products that could go in, uh, catch on fire just because of the, the temperature level and the heat that's given off, even if there's no visible flame. So that has to be considered. Uh, of course, no expl explosion or disassembly, uh, rupture, meaning that the, the enclosure split open and therefore um, directly exposes the interior cells such that any fire would no longer be protected by the enclosure. So of course, that's a, a fairly hard uh, failure. Um, <clears throat> There may be additional gas analysis or smoke evaluation. Sorry, I wrote that twice here. Um, and, and that could be at the cell level um, just to see what is the um, contribution from the cell itself. And then additional gas analysis or smoke evaluation at the system or installation level because we're looking at the combination of uh, the lithium ion cell as well as any other potential uh, combustible uh, components or plastics or other insulation materials within the battery or around the battery that could also uh, be consumed in a fire. And we look at what's the overall uh, toxicity, what's the, what's the potential uh, safety hazard just of the smoke that's created uh, beyond the battery itself. Again, from a lab um, perspective, we, we look at what's the ability or inability to observe or monitor uh, the events within the battery. Um, you know, it, if it may seem like a good idea to skip that module or submodule representative assembly test and go right to a full system test. However, from a lab standpoint, um, you know, we want to evaluate the potential risks and what are the worst cases of a cell to cell propagation. So building up from the smallest single cell and stepwise going up to a full system is generally the safest means for the lab to make, ensure that we have uh, the ability to contain an event if there was an actual failure during the test, as well as to assess the risk of how likely is the failure of a certain system test. Um, <clears throat> we worry about the repeatability of the cell trigger event. So we wanna do as many iterations as necessary to get a repeatable means at the single cell before we go ahead and try to perform the test at a larger modular system level. Um, I, I put in here almost as a joke, uh, anytime I hear a client come to me first with, my system is so safe, I don't even need to do the test. Those tend to be the ones that have the most uh, glorious uh, events that, that occur when you do the test. So, um, you know, despite your, you know, individual confidence on a system's design, um, you know, there's still not really a, an overall workaround for avoiding um, the testing. However, uh, having good documentation, FMEAs and that in place helps to build that confidence, both for the test lab, the inspectors, uh, the regulators, uh, that may be the representative subsystem uh, level is sufficient. Um, of course, personnel and sa facility safety, you know, this is, uh, um, you know, primary concern for us. Um, measurement requirements, we may want to collect a lot of gas, but at the same time, from a lab safety standpoint, we want to ventilate this and run, the, run as much smoke through the scrubber as possible to reduce further propagation beyond the battery itself. So that makes it a lot more difficult to do gas sampling when you're trying to evacuate the chamber or the test area of that gas. Um, and of course, the non-representative test setups, um, you know, we're trying our best to make something that's simulating what goes out in the field, but we may actually have a system that we can't, uh, if you will, guarantee or, or, or provide enough uh, confidence that it is representative of what's going to go out in the field. And even with successful testing, um, you haven't convinced an inspector or an insurance agent or a landlord that your battery design is safe to install.
So we've got to uh, summarize here again, cell to cell propagation is still a major concern. There are quite a few methods out there, but they, they generally uh, fall under the same scope of triggering a single cell event, trying to see whether or not that propagates at a module, submodule, larger system. Um, and uh, those trigger methods may or may not be repeatable. So even if I can create a, in a laboratory environment, um, a certain method of triggering a single cell event, it may or may not um, represent what actually happens in the field. So you still can't uh, replicate uh, the actual field field issues, understanding the actual um, uh, incidents that occur in the field and trying to use those to feed back into how you perform this testing in the future. So I apologize, it did take us right up to the full hour. Um, my contact information is on the screen. Martin, I believe we do have a few extra minutes we can go over. Um, and for those that would like to stay on, uh, we'll let them stay on. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct, Rich. And I've just got to say before I start the Q&A session, that was absolutely brilliant, Rich. Brilliant presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so looking at the uh, questions, uh, yeah, I do appreciate that. I'm looking at some here. here. Yeah, go ahead. So I'm going to read the uh, one for Matthew here, and his question is, um, just to clarify, uh, NFPA 855 is an installation standard, not a building code? So um, you're correct in that it's a standard, but generally speaking, the NFPA standards are adopted as part of building codes. Uh, so in effect, if the county of Los Angeles or the city of New York fire inspector decides that for an installation to be approved, it has to follow the requirements of NFPA 855. It's essentially a building code. Um, so I apologize if, if, if the, the wording was unclear, but uh, my intent there was to uh, uh, indicate that NFPA 855 has essentially become a de facto standard um, for building requirements and installation requirements of energy storage systems. Thanks, Rich. Uh, I've got a question here from Yong. Um, how to prevent thermal runaway for EV batteries? Yeah, that's a <laughs> that's a great question. Um, and I do apologize. As a test lab, you know, I'm really giving the the um, the viewpoint of the lab trying to implement the the, the test methods. Um, however, you know what we see uh, are. are of course, redundancy in your battery management system, monitoring systems so that you are robust against any type of fault that may occur in that management system that sensors, you know, if you have a bad sensor, does the system shut down? So what are your fail safes within your existing design? And then in a physical design, it's really understanding how an individual cell will, will individually fail and knowing, if you will, the the, the pattern that, that a cell might uh, uh, catch on fire, for example, where are the vents, where are the seams that are going to burst open, uh, uh, for example, you know, do you prevent that from directly impinging on an adjacent cell, just in the physical layout of your battery, maybe even just the orientation of the cells. So those are those are a few of the key areas. Again, I apologize, I'm not a manufacturer. Um, and I know some of the uh, the installation manufacturers, the and other uh, materials, people would have uh, some some pretty novel solutions for you. Um, but again, those are just the general uh, basic design guidelines I would follow. Thank you, Rich. Uh, question here, Nitin. Um, can, a cell, uh, can a cell get thermal runaway while it is neither charging nor discharging? Great question. So that is what we talk about as the, um, the latent failures, meaning the, uh, the manufacturing defects or the aging effects. Um, and in fact, what happens there is the actual charging, discharging, or physical temperature um, swings that the battery goes through uh, can cause, for example, that um, foreign object to wear through uh, the separator such that it creates a short circuit uh, within the battery. Even when you take that charge or discharge load or charging um, voltage away, that internal short circuit has already begun. And so even within the individual cell, there could be a fairly delayed amount of time that that propagates and grows. And that small short and that small amount of heat becomes a greater amount of heat until it actually um, causes the cell to go into runaway and then you have the propagation event. So uh, yeah, one of the major concerns here in that the statistical notes I mentioned before are this exact case where the cell, even while it's not actively charging, discharging, can still potentially go into a thermal runaway. Thank you, Rich. Um, 
Another question from Young. Uh, which materials can be used for or against thermal away? Again, I apologize as a test lab, I, I can I can neither recommend nor, nor uh, endorse any specific products, but I, I would say that generally speaking, there are there are a lot of uh, developments in um, thermally conductive but electrically non-conductive uh, fluids uh, to be used uh, such that you have a method of not only providing a good surface area cooling of the cells within the battery, but potentially that fluid acts as a bit of a fire suppressant. So even if a cell did go into runaway, um, that cooling fluid acts as a fire suppression agent. Uh, that's one method I'm seeing um, a lot more development right now. Uh, obviously, it's a higher cost and, and fluids versus you know uh, gel or, or, or solid solid materials can can have their own uh, challenges uh, the other are again um, more of the layout of the cell such that you reduce the the uh, cell's ability to propagate heat or fire from one cell to the adjacent cells and then some level of insulation in between thank you i've got a two-parter here from uh, yasutaka i've been saying that for the last couple of days i do hope i've got it right um right the question is has the certif certification test for thermal propagation in great britain electric vehicle safe norm been started at intertech already so i believe you're talking about the uh gb meaning the chinese standards um, so we do have uh, capability of performing uh, some custom thermal propagation uh, tests here. Uh, it really depends on the size of the battery that we're talking about and the, um, the specific um, monitoring we have to do. And I apologize that offhand, I can't recall the specific requirements in that GB, uh, GB or GBT standard. Um, again, my contact information is on the screen. I would recommend, yeah, please uh, please reach out to me separately and, and we could talk about uh, the specifics of your battery and whether or not and, and where we could perform that for you. Okay, second part of the question is, uh, second question, sorry. Are some of the new configuration chemistry battery and uh, other than uh, usual uh, lithium or lithium iron battery have been developed? How have Intertech or any regulations certification agency treated for safety certification, e.g. all solid state batteries installed on Mercedes electrical electric buses? That's a great question. Um, and I, I kind of, uh, again, jokingly refer, referred to this earlier in the, my battery is so safe, so I don't need to test it case. And that's where a lot of these, these up, up and coming solid state uh, or, or pseudo solid state uh, batteries that should be much safer. Um, similarly speaking, going back a few years, lithium iron phosphate, different lithium uh, polymer types of cells. Um, while they may be safer than other chemistries and less volatile than other chemistries, from a regulatory certification standpoint, we treat them all under the general umbrella of lithium ion. And I could tell you that from the transportation dangerous goods regulation standpoint, they, they carry the same UN code, UN 3484 lithium ion batteries, regardless of the specific chemistries and anode cathode materials. So, um, the short answer is they're treated all as the same lithium ion. And until we have, I would say, probably a few years of data to show that one or another a very specific chemistry is essentially inert, um, it's going to remain that way. And that may be part of that additional classification work by UNECE to uh, create a separate classification for lithium ion batteries. Thanks, Rich. I've got a question here from Helen. Um, I saw that you shared a variety of strategies for inciting a runaway situation. How do companies determine how to cause runaway in testing? That's an excellent question too. Um, the, um, as I mentioned, the, the standards tend to drive us toward using the external heating as the primary means of triggering the runaway, you know, using either a wire wrapped around the cell or one of those captain heaters or a cartridge heater adjacent to the cell to just put external heat into the cell uh, without electrically abusing it, without driving it beyond its operating parameters other than temperature. Um, that's the first method that's recommended by the standards and specifically required in the UL 9540A standard. Uh, other methods, generally it comes from either knowing actual field failures that, for example, if field failures have occurred due to excessive charge and discharge cycling or have occurred more to um, manufacturing defects, then that would drive you to want to utilize that method as the most representative of what your battery technology could 
see in the field. Um, again, from the battery lab standpoint, if I can't do the physical external heater, I'm usually going towards an electrical means such as overcharge or short circuit, just from a feasibility standpoint. Thank you, Rich. Um, another a question here from Paul. Explosive gas venting is as dangerous as flaming cascading. What are your thoughts on standards focusing on flames outside DUT, etc.? Also, gas, gas measurement at module or unit level is very hard to measure accurately. Yeah, that's a <laughs> multi-part question there. Um, of course, the, 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 the venting gas is, is a concern. What I see and then what we end up, I would say, more commonly doing is, is adding an external spark source uh, within the test area so that we're making a quick evaluation of whether or not that is a flammable uh, gas. Because even though uh, sometimes we know that the lithium batteries have you know organic solvents that are highly flammable, they don't always propagate in the call it cloud of smoke that comes up. Um, so there are cases where that, that smoke does not ignite, um, but there could be something that would ignite either on an actual liquid spilling out of the cell. Um, so there's not really an easy way to do this at the, the module or, or, or system level. It really ends up being a bit more of that representative subsystem or that individual single cell where you're trying to trigger that event capture as much gas uh, as possible at the smallest building block and, and evaluating it there. Uh, the alternate I see is using a called the common four gas method, a uh, lower explosive limit, you know, LEL, oxygen depletion, CO uh, or CO2 and or hydrocarbons, just looking at uh, kind of more common EPA type of concerns that we would be, you know, just again, a feasible means of evaluating uh, what's coming off the batteries. Uh, unfortunately, I think there's still there's still a bit of work to do in terms of quantifying those. Thank you, Rich. Another question. Uh, will the UNECER 100 ever be updated to include cell level, cell level requirements? I don't see that currently, um, primarily because the the R regs, if you will, the e, e marking regs are designed around a full vehicle and then you have some safety critical components uh, going through an assembled component qualification. So in this case, you're somewhat pre-qualifying the battery before it goes into crash testing in, in the full vehicle. Um, so I just don't see that the regulation getting down into that individual component level. Uh, however, um, I, I could see a potential for implementing uh, a cell to cell propagation test uh, within the R regulation, just for the reasons I spoke about before. The statistics tell me that I'm gonna have, you know, more, more events, the more vehicles are on the road. Thank you. Um, next question, do uh, Intertech have, uh, have your own labs facilities to carry out tests? Yes, <laughs> of course. Uh, yes, we do. Uh, primarily the, the site I mentioned here in Plymouth, Michigan, uh, we have a, a, a sister site to that in Kaufbaren, Germany, near Munich, and uh, multiple sites in greater China. Uh, we also use some third party or, or, or subcontract vendors for locations, as well as some of our own, call it non-battery fire test sites to do larger format uh, abuse and cascade tests. Thank you, Rich. Uh, next question. Uh, what is the most real world method for triggering a runaway? <laughs> uh, again, it does it does depend on the cells and, and what I would I mentioned on the earlier question, you know, if you have any actual field failures or any actual evidence of your specific cell design or battery design, how it has potentially had a failure in the field, that's generally going to be your, your best case of what's representative for you. Um, again, with those methods, I'd say none of them are really the best out of, out, out of uh, all the rest, you know, the mechanical um, uh, or mechanical defects of the battery, those aren't necessarily repeatable to represent what's actually going to happen uh, because a, a defect is by itself a, a, a lack of, of consistency. Um, so um, having a very consistent mechanical defect is not necessarily representative. So again, I, I look at things like the overcharge and, and, and short circuit as being ways from a lab standpoint. Those are events that I can see occurring over time, even if the battery management system's in place, you can have uh, some level of buildup over time of overcharge events or short circuit load events. Thank you very much. Okay, Rich, um, final question for you. The question yes. is, um, who is responsible for getting testing done? The cell or the battery supplier or the end client? Right, so um, 
and, and I see this question a lot because we deal often with system integrators who are putting, say, an energy storage system together for a specific facility, and they're expecting to get pre-qualified or certified components at the component level. Um, so it really, it really does stretch across the supply chain. Uh, there are cell level tests that the cell manufacturers can perform. You know, number one, uh, developing or determining a repeatable trigger method uh, for these tests. While cell manufacturers don't necessarily want to admit how, you know, the weaknesses potentially in their cells, understanding that these are abusive tests and which abuse method is most representative of what can happen in the field. Um, you know, I would say, best case for everybody is that the cell supplier takes that uh, um, responsibility. But then it's whoever is next taking those cells into whatever format, whether it's the module, the full battery pack, a full enclosure, that next building block, you know, they would have, uh, say, the next level to be able to do that module, cell to cell propagation. Those are the people that are most uh, determining the layout of cells between each other, you know, the adjacent cells uh, and any spacing or insulation between those cells. So um, in an ideal world, that final installation person is really doing the least amount of evaluation at the current status. They are the ones that are essentially responsible for doing all the qualification tests. Thank you very much, Rich. That was absolutely a brilliant Q&A session. Uh, you've been absolutely superb. I'm going to say again, that was an absolutely fantastic presentation. We're going to have to get you back for Rich by Check Part <laughs> 2 because that was absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. I look forward to it. And uh, for those that are still on the line, you know, I appreciate any feedback on, on topics that you'd like to see addressed. Uh, again, my contact information is on the screen, and I look forward to uh, working with any and all of you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I would like again to say a big thank you to Rich from Intertech for, as I said it three times, an excellent presentation and a superb Q&A session. Thank you very much. Um, today's webinar will be on demand for you to rewatch as well. Thank you to everybody for attending. Um, stay safe all. Have a lovely weekend. We do look forward to seeing you all at our next We Automotive webinar. Thank you all. Thank you, Rich, and goodbye. Thank you.